Uh, welcome. I have Edwin here. Uh, he lives in Houston, but I think he's going to move somewhere else. Um, yep. I don't, have you told? I have. I, okay. I've announced it. Great. So it's it's so, okay to say now. Yeah. I think he's going to go to uh, Rudy's home state. So he <laughs> has two packs of Legends and two packs of Antiquities. Mm -hmm. You can never say that. Um, and these are really old. Um, yeah, about sense. 25 years old. It's been forever since I opened these. I used to draft these set. Uh, not this one. I don't think I've ever opened too much of this one because it was the um, eight card pack. Wow. And no one really wanted to, like it, the, the price was the same. Yeah. It's like, why would you ever go with eight versus 15? Exactly. But in hindsight, it's a pretty good eight card pack. Yeah. <laughs> I actually never got to open any of these. The oldest packs I ever opened before today was um, an Italian Legends. That when I started wow. in 96, they were still like $30 each or something. And I remember that same shop that like I've told people I played this game against Weissman years ago, a mirror match, because I, I jumped right into vintage. That same store, they were selling um, Italian Legends packs for something like $25, $30 each. Which at the time would have been considered very expensive. Exactly. Like I mean, who's going to pay $25 for a pack? I felt very risky and I think I pulled an abyss out of there and I wish I still had it, right? <laughs> It would have been fantastic. Yeah, I think we were talking and you sold your collection a few times. Uh, yes, um, four times, no, sorry, three times I've sold Power 9 along with most of my collection and then four times I've bought Power 9. Yeah, so I sold my collection twice and man, it just hurts, you know, to look at these prices. So yeah. uh, especially because of old school. <laughs> so do you want to talk a little bit more about, I'm not that familiar. I mean, I'm a big benefactor. Yeah. Uh, I think I was showing around just, uh, just random yeah. Five cent, one penny cards that I'm yep. now like, uh, that pixie, what was yep. that pixie? Argothian pixie. Which now you're telling me people actually play with that card. Oh yeah. <laughs> I couldn't, I, it's still mind blowing to me. Um, just, I mean, I am a big benefactor of it because I have rows mm -hmm. and rows of these old cards, but the only reason I have them yep. is I couldn't get rid of them. Yep. They're, no one would buy them for me. Like, so do you want to yeah. go into Yeah, I'd school? love to. So there's a couple things that are interesting for people that are coming back to like these old cards, like old school. What, a couple things to know about it is even though the cards have been around for a really long time, the meta is very different. And there's like two main reasons for it. One of them is that people are coming back in with a lot more knowledge. And so there's mechanics in the game that people know that they could actually make mm. use of that they didn't understand back then. For That's example, true. people really thought like City of Brass wasn't that good of a card because nobody wanted to pay that one life. Or take <laughs> life that one was uh, very valuable back in the day. Exactly. But now people see that it, the game is really largely about card advantage and they see that spreading into other colors can really let you diversify that deck. And so it's not looked at with the same perspective. So the, the knowledge of like 25 years of magic coming back has absolutely changed it. The second thing to really know about it is there's a couple of rules changes from the time we used to play it back then that are actually very significant. Oh, I did not know that. So what yeah. what a change are there cards that are a perfect example. You and I were talking about Mishra's Factory. Yeah. And Mishra's Factory back then, of course it's always been a good card. It's been dead, but really now good. it like it's pretty dominant in the format. And the reason is it almost entirely comes down to the fact that you can block you know and then after your blocker is declared, you can tap it, pump itself and block with a 3-3 blocker, that didn't exist back then. In oh, fact, right, if right, you open right. up the rule yeah. books, it specifically says tapped creatures do no damage. So that suddenly turned Mishra's Factory into a 3-3 blocker that you don't, you know, you can keep an Abyss out, you can Wrath of God and keep it there. It's much harder to kill. So question about, like, um, the rules. Yeah. Who determines that, like, like you know how EDH has, like, an independent committee? The committee with Sheldon, Menory, and all them? Yeah. And yeah. is there a committee for old school magic or is it Star City? I know um, Star City Games and Channel yeah. Fireball are now having events on it. Yes. And I actually did some research before you came. It looks like Channel Fireball actually has a um, explanation, they have, they have a page. right? Yep. So you don't yep. actually, you can play like a fourth edition card, right? As oh. Under certain guidelines, right? Yeah. So um, there, there are rules committees, kind of, quasi kind of. There's like three main sections that like most people refer to. There's a channel fireball set of rules, and then there's the eternal central rules, and then there's what everybody refers to as like the Swedish rules. And they're pretty similar in many respects. The one that is the most broken off is the Swedish, and those are the guys, as far as I know, that kind of created this format and they yeah. kind of brought it back out. What the Swedish guys say is it's many people consider it to be kind of like exclusive because they say only original print cards. 
So like if a card was made, oh, but then okay. it was reprinted. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> They're yeah. going to be the exclusive high end. Yeah. Black so, border. Yeah, you show up, yep. you know, with an eight hundred dollar revised underground C, and the Swedish guy. Now. Yeah, a Swedish guy will look at it and say that's not good enough. It has to be <laughs> alpha, beta, or limited, right? Enough. Right. So oh, that's yikes. that's rough. Yikes. And that's one of the biggest differences. Other than that, their main difference is that they don't include fallen empires. And that's they, a big one. That is a pretty for big me, one. For me, because I have a tons of fallen empire bulk. Yep. And they also um, their ban restricted list is very slightly different. Like they actually only allow one strip mine, whereas like now Eternal Central and four? Channel Fireball yeah, have four. four. Wow. And that is a big change in the format. Now for all of them though, and this is one reason old school today is different than the meta then, Mana Drain is a restricted card now. You can only have one copy. And mm. Black Vice is unrestricted and Berserk is unrestricted. So there's there's shifts in the ban restricted list and there's shifts in the actual rules and the understanding which have actually changed old school today to be slightly different. So I, mean, I remember Open Boosters was actually kind of irritated about that because he was like- He plays old school. He now does now it. Now he plays. Okay. He first, it makes sense. He has a collection. Yeah. When he first started, he was like, wait a minute, we can't do that. And he was correct. Like a good one is Chaos Orb. Chaos Orb has an entirely different errata. It actually says you can only hit one target and you have to pick the card that you're going to destroy. And then when you, you still have to do the flip it and you still have to land on the card and stuff like that, but it's only one target. So you no longer have to spread your cards out and stuff like that. No, I'm not going to flip a, what is it, $800 card now? Oh, 3000 for a $3,000 card. Well, I do. <laughs> I've got, oh, yeah. My whole you have a deck, beta one. Yeah, I have a beta one right here. This is the deck. Does it ever like... Ever you think maybe I shouldn't be flipping this three thousand dollar card? You know what's funny is like if you have cards that are good enough to grade, then you don't play them. If you have cards that are like LP, ah, I got it, got it, got it. So at that point, it doesn't matter. What's another nick on the out? Right. Know, so I mean, here's LP. here's my unlimited Lotus that's probably worth seven thousand dollars right now. Um, would you well, ever well, sell this? Actually, no. Sorry, that one's probably like. Five. Is there ever a price point where it goes high enough that you would sell? At this point, every time I've sold, I've regretted it, and so so pretty much no. Unless. It would have to be a life That's situation a that would push me to want to sell. Other than that, I, I have no desire to sell. But I'll show you my, my Chaos Orb here. And literally, this is the deck that I just played in the old school oh, I would tournament. love to do a video of the deck itself. Sure, we can do that. You... So that's my Chaos Orb, and that is a nice. beta Chaos Orb. And you do flip it. <laughs> I do flip it. Yeah, I, I ruffle here. All these cards, I mean, I'll ruffle these things and Ooh. shuffle them up. <laughs> that's... But these ones, almost nothing in here so the is deck, like the that, total value of the deck. What were you estimate at? This one, it's probably between twenty five to forty five. I'd have to look at a car, a nice uh, for, a for nice the whole car. deck. Yeah, a nice car. Yeah, yeah, easily. But yeah, I do play this whole deck. So you but, went to a tournament, right, at Las Vegas? You did yes. pretty well. I got um, second. Second. In the, How many in the, people were in the tournament, and did everyone have Power Nine? Like, does ever is everyone playing the optimal deck? I guess is my question. Really good question. So there was ninety two people in. That's it a lot. Was, That's more than I expected. It was filled with Hall of Famers. I mean, we had Randy Bueller, Brian Weissman, Louis Scott. Because they've been playing the game forever, so they have the cards. Right. So I mean, all these big names were in fact there. And no, everybody did not have power. I'd say if I had to just ballpark it, I'd say thirty to forty percent of the okay. field was unpowered, so and it, they did well actually. So they can be competitive without the power. That's one really big thing I want to dispel for old school. Remember, is, I was we were I was explaining to to um, to MTG Lion off camera Tony. <laughs> that um, that you don't actually need to have power, and that you can be very competitive. And many decks actually were were playing without power at the GP Vegas tournament. And one of the guys that was there, um, Jonas, came out from Sweden. He's a very well known Swedish player. So this and, it was invented in Sweden, old school. Yeah, old school. Is it because they have lots of cards there, or like that seems such a weird place that they would accumulate? There's a, there's a lot of guys there that are passionate about it. So, so Jonas, I'll come back to that. So Jonas specifically, he played mono red and he finished, I think in the list, like out of 92 people, he was like 13th or something like mono red. Like, I don't remember if he actually even had a single power card in his deck. And there was, there was, and a he kid. doesn't need the duel, right? If, yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was mono red. And there was a kid that played a mono black deck that actually took it from my budget series and my YouTube channel. I'll link that right here. Hit this kid, Kyle was like 13. I did some interviews and stuff with him. He played a slightly modified version of my black deck. And he's like, he's a 13 year old kid. He's new to old school, no power. And he won at least two of his matches. So it's dark put up a good fight into nightmare. Is that what he's winning Into with? like hypnotic spectrum. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> so, so uh, it's a hypnotic, huge misunderstanding yeah, that people think you have to have power in old school. You absolutely don't. And in fact, there's times where 
Um, the power cards are actually like not as helpful. Like if I draw like a Lotus in a land and let's say I've got a Jazam, right? Yeah. You think it's, it's just very expensive hand, but you drop it on the table and then for a $1 revised Swords to Plowshares, they nuke him off the table. And I'm down two cards, right? Because I use my Lotus and the Jazam to, to try to like establish that dominance, but then it just blows it right off the table. So the Black Lotus and the Power Nine, they're very powerful and vintage in any other format. But when you limit it down to like fallen empires, these and broken is, cards suddenly become bad. Also, because it's more casual, less competitive. It seems like a more fun environment than like, okay, there's 800 people. I need to win to finish the top eight. Too. Right. Is it more friendly? It is absolutely more friendly. In fact, like what people did even during the tournament, all the way into like the top eight, which where there was actually prize money and stuff on the table. Yeah, like, yeah, of course. People were actually like letting the other guy, if they were allowed to try to drop to seven or if a mistake was made, it's like, oh, that's fine. You know, let him just move ahead. The judge would be like, are you sure? No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> Instead that of real sharpie, you were like crazy. There was <laughs> which all- Which happens to me in the yeah, absolutely almost none of it in fact like i just had a game against randy bueller last night um or yesterday i should say we were playing over video and uh some guys were streaming it online and you could i'll probably have it up at some point but like you know he made a play mistake and you know he's like he's hall of famer he's a very (laughs) well-known guy and he's very good but like when he made the play mistake you know at first i was like what do we do but then afterwards it's like okay you know it's fine go ahead and do it and he chose not to because he's, he's very professional and so he did great during those games as well. And you guys have to watch the games to see how they went. But that's definitely how old schoolers roll. They care more about the game. They care less about like who wins and stuff like that. Because most of the time when you show up and you're playing this, this game, I mean, you're just doing it for fun. They're not doing to try to make a name for themselves. The whole right because like how big would you how big would you be as the top owner? You know, if yeah. you're if you win a GPS standard, boom. Your article Absolutely. writing career is now beginning. Yep. Even the judges during the championship, they were making comments to Jason Murray and I that like, you know, I wish I could officiate like this kind of tournament more often because everyone in the whole format is so easy going. And so just the whole thing beginning to end, it's, it's more laid back. It's not as broken as people think. There are absolutely budget and mid-range decks that are completely competitive. There was even a black deck, a mono black that won an Eternal Central t- f- tournament against fully powered decks just a little while ago. But people forget that because they think about the vintage cards in context of vintage. And so Power it, 9, yeah. Yeah, That's so if you add that. in the Yawgmoth's Will, the Force of Will, you add in the Zern Orb and like all yep. of these other cards, <laughs> then crazy cards, these cards, they go from very powered to like incredibly overpowered. But when you keep it within the confines of 93, 94, it actually, the cards actually balance out. Because what well. can you really do with a Black Lotus, right? A Jin, a Hypnotic Spectre, right? Like, yeah, you're a kind Lotus of restricted is a... to like free mana. What you can do today is incredibly. Exactly. Uh, but exactly. in old school, it might not have that many cards. So yep. you're, so mana acceleration may not be in them. And that's how I grew up. Like, exactly. Um, I grew up playing, um, Pokemon, Pokemon came out during Urza Saga, mm-hmm. and Pokemon was very interesting because the energy or the comics. Mm-hmm. So in Magic, when I was playing in Beta Unlimited and like Arabian Nights, I had no concept that these dual lands would ever be valuable. Yeah. Because I just assumed, well, for, first of all, I didn't know they were rares because mm-hmm. like, you know, you're, you're a little kid, but I just assumed that the land base would be really good mm-hmm. as opposed to the creatures. That's yeah. what, I think that's why when you look at the... Um, Beginning of Magic, Shivering Dragon, mm-hmm. very expensive card. Yeah. More expensive at one time than I think Black Lotus. Oh yeah, and way more very, expensive very early. than any of the dual lands. Yeah, people would trade a By Lotus a ton, for yeah. a Shivering Dragon straight and up. Especially the dual lands, because mm-hmm. people are thinking this is the top end creature. No creature yep. will ever get better than this card right here. Yeah, but and it's it amazing out what the mana. Does. Yeah, it turned out the mana was the problem, not the creatures. Yep. But like you were telling me, um, I'm watching a video about a collection. A, what's an Alpha Shivy Dragon? A thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. Yeah, straight up. Still okay. Yeah, you, you still made out <laughs> not as good as an Alpha Lotus, but a thousand bucks is a thousand bucks, right? Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. And it's funny because you can go to a revised Shiv and Dragon, and you got like a buck, right? Unlimited then, is worth a bunch. Like, uh, yeah, unlimited seen, is probably thirty, fifty. I've seen something unlimited like jump uh, recently in price. Um, Oh, I could talk to that a little bit. So what's happening is people are seeing what they, they keep on saying buyouts and reserve lists. No, 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 let's dispel that. What's happening is in old school, you have to play original art and you have to play original card frame. 
So like if you have a Birds of Paradise that's like 10th edition and the art is different, no frame, you can't use it. So what people are doing is they're going into the original art, original frame cards, and they first go straight to the ones that are like Alpha, Beta, and Limited. Oh, of course. And the original print, Arabian Nights, all that. Yeah. But eventually when all those, the Revise. supply on those is gone and the price is high, People are then going into the unlimited and the revised. And so the let me ask you this: Do you think your revised will spike? Yes, because that's a crazy that the amount of print run at revised is insane compared to unlimited. MTG line, it already is. Absolutely, revised is spiking. Revised is starting to go up. <laughs> when you saw oh underground C hit nine hundred dollars, well, I, no, well, I'm so that's, that is old that's school. underground C, right? But what about like the uh, I saw. What was that? The uh, Assassin? Royal Assassin? Yes, that one has yep. gone up and revised. Yep, they all are. Is and that because they're, they're old going, school? Oh yeah, the okay. old school is so completely that's of old the school. reason. The, the best way to look at it, and I can put numbers on this to actually help. So Alpha, you had 1,100 rares. Beta had 3,300. <laughs> yeah. Unlimited was 15,500 rares. So that's that's a very small one. It's like 20,000 yeah, of all those original prints. You, you go to revised and you go to 211,000 rares of each each individual rare that's of a white huge, quarter That's English. a huge jump. Yeah. It's a huge jump. It's a huge and jump. And then I think when you went fourth edition um, and such, it was I think it was fairly similar to, the, similar to what the revised print run is. But still, when you go out across the entire world, there's far less of those than like any of the newer sets, right? Oh yes, of course. And yeah. so, of course, like, it's finally like now, like the, I tell people the sleeping giant of of print run size is now finally it's awoken and it's now being felt and now alpha beta unlimited are going up to where they should be i get be. those because and now revised those are... revised is finally coming up as well because their print run sizes are also like it's, well, it's nothing compared to the newer stuff so i checked up the prices of um what's the dark yeah and they're they're creeping up too Oh, absolutely so it's not just like revised dark like what if someone had to start right now yeah like where would they start like Okay, this is a great question. And uh, Power I've, nine lands. There's or... two ways to go about it that I think are rock solid ways. If you want to jump straight into old school and you want to have the big cards, you know that's your goal. There's only one way to do it if you're going to save the most money. You get as much cash together as you can, cash, and then you make you find someone who has a big collection, cards well above what you actually need. And let's let's just imagine for a second, it's like a thirty thousand dollar collection. And so you you saved up like twenty yep. grand, right? Mm -hmm. And so you offer the guy twenty thousand dollars cash for his thirty thousand dollar collection. Yep. So then you buy it, and now you take out the cards that you need for your deck, and you sell the rest. And you sell the got rest, it. and maybe at the end of it, you've still got ten thousand dollars cash because you maybe you made back another ten selling stuff. Yeah. But you still have ten thousand dollars invested. But let's say maybe you've got like twenty thousand dollars worth of cards still because it was thirty thousand dollar collection. So now you've, you've, got, you've spent 10, you've got value of 20, and now you've got that deck that you actually need and you effectively got them for half price. And so it does require effort, it requires Some that work, eBay yep. account. But if you're gonna go straight into the big stuff, that's the only good way to do it. If you're gonna start small, and this is a wholly different concept, but it's very valid. Say somebody wants to jump into old school and they take like one of my budget decks in my mm -hmm. channel, and they spend like $300 and they get like a budget green, right? And so you start with that budget green. It is competitive. You you can finish halfway up the mix. But then as your budget allows, maybe you buy your Savannahs for it. So you can splash white. Maybe you buy those Berserks for it. You start, you start upgrading the deck. And now let's say you get busy for a while. You don't play the game for like two years. You put the deck in a closet. Well, when you come back later, it's old school. The cards didn't go down. So you come right back in. You not only have a playable deck. But their value probably went up relative to everything else. And the deck type is still there. And the deck is still there. And let's say you didn't even want to play green anymore. Well, it's old school. People will trade old school for old school. So you will be able to find someone who will trade that green deck for all the cards to do like blue. And so it's like once you've invested money in old school, it stays there. You ha completely have the ability to trade it around. And whatever your de current deck is, as your budget allows, you, you can upgrade that deck. So if you're gonna go budget, that's the way to go. If you're gonna go big time, then save up as buy much cash as you can yeah. and just buy a collection straight up. You know, um, I've been interested. I've opened up a store, right? So I'm getting these emails of people, and like, um, I wish I had my phone. I would show you. People were trying to sell me single beta cards, uh -huh. like single beta cards. <laughs> like, what will you offer me on this? I'm like, it's like five cents. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, they're worth <laughs> serious cash. I mean, like single be beta commons, like mm -hmm. like orc something or something, and oh, it's yeah. just like, why are you showing me this? <laughs> yeah, it's but it's when you've been disconnected from old old school, 
and you're an old player like you, it's hard to feel that you're spending good money. Like if yeah, I no, I, say, I can't, I can't imagine. Like beta I land or else, if, if I was to offer it to you for seventy dollars, you would feel like, oh no way, would I put seventy bucks into it? But the going market rate is like one hundred ten, one hundred twenty. Yeah. So that would actually be a fantastic deal. So you kind of like, and this is understandable for in, anyone. Like I, for investment in general, you only want to buy things you understand. And if you come into it and you don't feel right with it, then definitely I would tell people not to buy. Go do that research, right? But then once you do that research and you realize, okay, it actually is valid. And you realize the reserve list is not going to go away. So I am glad I met you because I think you have dispelled some of the things that I was worried about, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, I is it a group of people like Rudy <laughs> together buying this stuff and they never play it, right? And then they encase it. But it looks like... I it's mean, all over the board. It. it looks like people play it, oh, though. They which play it I, so much. People are so passionate about this. But it is true. There are people that are buying for investment. They've got piles of certain cards. Buyouts do happen. That is true. But I will absolutely tell you the biggest driver for this is, is the format itself and is people playing. I can't tell you how many people that are exactly like me that are buying just play sets of cards as fast as they can before they all spike. When you buy a play set, majority. it's a little different because there might not be that many... Exactly. To begin with, so playset might actually spike the price from itself, especially yep. when talking alpha, beta, rares, or yep. something like that. Um, um, there's one other before we open a pack. There's one other thing I'd like to lay on you that like a lot of people don't understand. Like the reserve list is a big topic, and people talk about it as if it's going to go away. Let me give you a rock solid reason why I believe it's, it's honestly never going to go away. And this is just math, just the math of it. When you look at the print run size. And you look at, uh, say, revised is two hundred eleven thousand of each rare. Like I was saying, your dog is really nice. <laughs> he's a very nice. He's um yeah. a great dog for fosters because uh -huh. you know a lot of fosters come from. Um, I want to keep of... my hands clean for the cards though. Oh so, right, so, right, right, right. Norman, sit. No, no, no he's he he can he can stay there. I just can't pet him. He's a very he's a very happy dog um, because um, he's very good with fosters. That's kind of why I kept them. A lot of fosters come from kind of abused homes yeah so they're not they don't trust humans very much oh, I see. but they'll trust like a dog right yeah because they're a dog themselves or a cat so so the reserve list so there's there's if we just look at dual lands in revised there's two hundred eleven thousand of each rare that was printed in revised mm -hmm. and there's 10 dual lands so if you do the math on that and then let's say you you value them at like five hundred dollars a piece or something yeah, yeah. on average yeah that's seven hundred and fifty million dollars in just white border English revised dual lands. We're not talking about alpha, yeah. beta, unlimited, none of those. Forget That's everything except for white border revised dual lands. That's almost a billion dollars in dual lands. So when you actually look at the total market cap of all the of the reserve list and all these old cards printed, you're deeply into the billions of dollars, right? Now you look at Wizards of the Coast. That company, I think they gross <laughs> like 350 million or something. Yeah, not, yeah. And, and their net profit is, I'm, I'm just guessing, say their net profit, let's say they're very efficient and they net profit 150 million a year out of 350 that's million not bad, gross. 50% margin, yeah. Sure, let's just say, let's let's be favorable. 50 but margin. now you got a company that's making 150 million profit and if they break the reserve list, they're liable for maybe 30, 40 billion in damages. And so that right there, that gives you a so scope that, of That's an interest. I've never heard of that before. You're yeah, no one ever talks about that. You're saying that the reserve list is actually more safe today these cards are more expensive. Exactly. When the average casual player would be like, no, we need the reserve list is less safe yes. because it is too expensive. That's exactly But the argument correct. you're making is, that's a pretty compelling argument. I've never heard of that argument before. No one ever mentions that. The reserve list. So, so Wizards of the Coast, through promissory estoppel, they would get sued because they- Somebody they, they would sue them, the yeah. List. I know somebody would sue them. And there's actually, as far as, this is, this is hearsay, this part. I've heard that they actually got sued in small ways and they actually already lost. So the point is there's already a precedent, but they, they said the reserve list, they certified it so many times, we're never gonna do this, and people have made financial commitments based on it. So the potential damages of breaking the reserve list is deep into the billions, at one time, and they couldn't they afford to break print it. print reserve list cards. Memory jar yeah. um, is a good one. Uh, yeah, that might've been what those lawsuits were over, by the way. It might be, because then they stopped. Yep. So they were printing like, yep. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember that, and I thought that was pretty, pretty foolish for them yeah. to stop. But you might, there might be a, a background reason they stop. I believe that's it. 
Absolutely. Because like I remember, I was like, oh, cool. So we won't have like regular reserve list cards. We'll yes. just have foil ones. Yes. That's what I was thinking. I think actually at this point, as far as I can tell, just kind of reading between the lines, I think they actually want to break the reserve list. To make money. Yeah. <laughs> to, of but, course. but I think they're just locked in. I think they just flat out can't. Yeah, because they got stricter on the policy. And I found yeah. that very strange. I was like, yeah. why would they ever go stricter? Because like, the liability, man. Because maybe somebody sued them and didn't go to court. They settled. Yeah. And then that's what happened. And the other thing to, and you're, you're a patent lawyer, so you yes, don't understand this. The other thing about it is like, let's say they even hint that they might break the reserve list. If they even hint at it, and that causes a value drop in the secondary market, people still, just for that, might be able to file a lawsuit based on damage. So it's not, all, honestly, many times it's not the lawsuit itself, the judgment that you worry about. It's the length of the lawsuit. It's the lawyers. I know the Wizard of Coast lawyer. Uh, mm -hmm. He's in Houston, actually. Oh, he is. And I mean, like, he charges uh, 800 an hour. I guess he so, can. So <laughs> uh, he would love to take this case for multiple years, right? Probably. <laughs> Just uh, draining them and draining them for money. Oh, yeah, he probably So it's, it. a lot of times it's not actually the judgment that you're worried about. It's yeah. the years of being in court, of, you know, stopping yeah. your business. Like, um, it's yeah. pretty, I, I imagine it is pretty. So but, the reason why this is so important is like many of you watching this, you might wonder like, are these guys that are dropping all this money on all these old cards, are they all nuts? Yeah, that's the, what I wonder. The people that are buying these cards and are dishing out hundreds of thousands of dollars, they already understood everything I just explained. Yep. And some of them tried to get it out there, but I mean, it's it's honestly, it's sad. It's That is the, the case of it, but I feel it as an old school player, it's sad that they cost so much because it prevents people from playing, right? And that's, that's why you good. can use proxies, right? I'm a big proponent of proxies. proxies. I've got videos on my channel talking about proxies. I absolutely believe those are the answer. And I think yeah, that, that's a whole topic. Maybe we could talk about that yeah, in another video. Yeah, we can talk video. about that in another. You want to open one of these? Yeah, okay. So let, let's get moving on. Yeah, go for it. Go ahead. Why don't you do the first well, one? Well, okay. Hi, bye. Wow. So I always open it like this, right? Because you uh -huh. want to keep the wrapper. Yeah. We we're talking about like wrappers and boxes and stuff. Uh huh. Um, this is a wrapper you want to keep. Wow. Oh, and then this is, um, I'll show this. This, I used to draft this all the time. Oh, really? Because <laughs> I didn't know I knew what the rare was. Yeah. Uh, it comes in, I think it's every single pack has one of them. Oh! Super and oh, oh, Yes! Oh, wow. Yes! Well, you know, um, Okay, so we went right a, to the rare. you want to give a shout out to the guy who gave you these? Like, do you want to mention that? Um, because obviously they're not sorted, right? They're not like, so you, there's no way that, like, he would like, so um i don't know if i can't I, I don't know if the person where where the source i got to, these yeah. wants to be revealed but I'll, I'll obviously check. this is a very good card that's not a search that's pack. not a search <laughs> pack and yeah. it's the first card here yeah any card would be searched it okay so be this the one. one on the front is the is the rare is a rare I so wow shivin library one. that's a great card in ed8 Sylvan library guys <laughs> great card look at that uh in the okay. sleeve, I guess. See, this is exciting for me because there's a lot of Legends cards I do need Spectra for my collection. Cloak. Uh, so this is kind of a mech card. Yeah. Um, Mountain Yeti. Cool. I think, is this a rare? Uh, Sylvan Library is an uncommon. This, this is, is the rare. I think this is Are the rare. Are you sure? I think the Sylvan is the rare. Okay. I, I could remember this Mountain Yeti being like a rare one time. <laughs> like, I should totally know, right? Um, it looks like a rare. It looks like Norway or something. Uh -huh. Uh, oh, I have a bunch of these, Ghosts, the Ghosts of the Damned. Of the Damned. Uh, this is the type of card that no one would ever want, uh -huh. and that's why I have like a couple hundred copies of them. Wall Vapor, this was a very popular card. Yep. I remember playing Wall Vapor. But wow, Shiv I mean, it doesn't get better than Sylvia yeah. Library. I have that one. is an EDH. It's, it's not on the reserve list, right? I, I think I, I've seen it reprinted. I don't think so. I think it I is. I think that's been reprinted, but for Agreed. old school, yes, it's you huge want this one, right? Absolutely. I have one Legend Sylvan before this, and now I got two. This is my I have second. a bunch of these. The Glyphs. Glyphs. Yeah, Glyphs. I have yeah, a bunch the of them. Glyphs are awesome. I'd love a Chain Lightning if we can pull one. Oh, that's, I think you're getting too greedy. <laughs> this show. There we go. Cat Warriors. I have a bunch of these. Yeah. Um, man, I mean, that is crazy. I didn't expect to pull something that good out of these. Because, like... You figured I, it was scanned. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense, right? In my mind. That uh -huh. if you're having this five hundred dollar pack and there's cards in look. it worth a thousand bucks, why these, would these you? actually came out of the a booster crazy. box for the from the person who I got them from? Pit Scorpion. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the poison before the poison. The infect. Remove souls playable. Wow. People do play that. Like, this is just incredibly clean and just. Oh yeah. Like, uh, 
if there's something about these cards being in a oh i think we'll go into uncommons now i think this is not uncommon active volcano which is mm -hmm. uh not hydro blast right what is it blue elemental blast is that uh, the pricey one uh that's in alpha beta unlimited revised all those blue elemental blast and red elemental blast and then ice age did pyroblast and hydroblast love this card yeah wolverine um, pack love animals um Keith Kim. oh siphon soul that's a good playable? one that one's good in edh people will play it it definitely in edh games so i mean uh no what's chain lightning warp right now it got reprinted so I, i'm ten? guessing it's not but you can play it in this game right so yeah investment thing here is probably worth 10 but if you guys find a chain lightning i would buy it <laughs> it's not gonna stay there for long i would buy any of them <laughs> okay so now i'm gonna do the second legends booster pack and looking at it it does not look searched to me the tops and the bottoms all look good how so, much do you think this card is worth the sylvan um for legends it was 60 a while ago i haven't looked it up for a while i think it's worth more yeah i think so now because yeah. it's great in EDH, and one of the reasons people, I think, are buying these older ones is because of EDH. It does look... Yeah. Okay. It looks like the best person. Okay, so this one's probably the rare. Oh, you didn't get an instruction card. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I didn't! You're right! So that's why I drafted them. I think these are worth money. Yeah, that's funny. I'm not kidding you. I think these are worth money, because I remember drafting them for, like, a purpose. So that's probably the rare. I think that's a rare. So, or... Field of Dreams. Um, that's Enchant that card. World. That's a rare because it's yeah. gone up in price. Enchant World. Top card of each player's library is always face up. I definitely did not have this. So there we go. So that, if this is not the rare, okay, this is Hellswarm. So I think what happens is this replaces a common. Oh, okay, there we go. Would be Dream Coat. I don't. Is that a rare? I don't really no, know. No, no, this is a rare. I'm almost certain that Field of Dreams is a rare. I should I, know this. I've seen right? it. I've seen this <laughs> card go up in price. Okay. Like a lot and. I'm almost certain this is on a reserve list. Okay, this has got to be an uncommon then, dream code, because I do not see those very often. In visions? Yeah, you know, this might be a <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I'm but so I'm confused. almost sure I've seen Field of Dreams go up a mm -hmm. ton in price. Dwarven Song. And Shelkin Brownie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Alabaster Potion. Oh, so what is a rare? I, I think it was. Field I think of it was Dreams, this right? One, Field of Dreams. Yeah. Oh, Emerald Dragonfly. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've seen this actually get played in old school because it's a green flyer. Kobolds. Everybody likes Kobolds. Yeah, the zero the casting. Glyph. Blue Glyph of Delusion. Remove Enchantment. Enchantments. And Cyclopean Mummy. So this could actually. This be was no. Play. This was actually um, in the inquest when I had it. This was voted the worst card in Magic history. Really? I remember reading it in a magazine. I was like, oh, it's not too bad. It's much worse than this. Yeah. But it was voted the worst. I have probably... Tundra Wolves are actually pretty good in White Weenie. So that's people playing it. Oh, White White Weenie's big. White Weenie well, actually play crushed this me. With Weenie. Savannah Lions? Yes, yeah, Savannah Lions and, and Army Tundra of Allah Wolves. is the other one. Because What's it, Army of All oh, your white plus creatures one, plus, one. plus two attack and plus zero defense. And it's like an instant. So they swing with all these White Weenies and then they play Army of Allah. There's two it's Arabian Nights, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so White Weenie is really good. Hornet Cobra. I have a bunch of those. <laughs> and the last one is Subdue. That's so, my Legends pack. I think this is valuable. The Field of Dreams? You should like really check, but your phone is being <laughs> used and my phone yeah. is not here. I think this has gone up in price because I remember looking at cards that I want to buy. Uh-huh. And that was one of them, but it spiked and then it spiked like the next day. Okay. And these things are very volatile. Yeah, they really are. Okay, so we're going to end this video here and go to the next one where we can open up the Antiquities packs. Yeah. So, thank you, MTG Lion. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, bye everybody. <laughs>